His was the only boat to arrive. I think maybe it was a cow. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> There's a thank you letter from Lyndon Johnson. There was even a monorail at one point to the east of us. Plus, everybody forgets about pirates. This is the coolest field trip I have ever been on. I don't know, but I've been told keep on dance for never get old. Hello and welcome to the Long Island History Project, the podcast that brings you stories and interviews with people passionate about Long Island history. You can hear them all at longislandhistoryproject.org. My name is Chris Kretz. I am your host, and our opening music is courtesy of the Homegrown String Band. We're continuing the trend of the last couple of episodes by talking to someone today about a family member not a suffragist, not a square dance caller, but a New York judge. We're talking to one of his daughters, someone who helped bring out his book, and who is today's very special guest. I'm Ellen Stark. I'm a uh, freelance writer and editor, but I'm also, for the purposes of this podcast, uh, the daughter of Thomas M. Stark, and I helped edit his book, Horrific Homicides, uh, after he passed away in 2014 and sort of saw it to the finish line to have it published. That, that's great that he had a writer in the family that could help you and your, your sister, I believe, right, <laughs> edited the final? Yes, my sister is a writer as well. So the two of us worked on the book. So first of all, thank you for joining us today. This is a, a great look. I, we're not a true crime podcast, and I have certain feelings about those, but it's great to talk about this important, um, the work your father did. Can you tell us a little bit about him? Give us some background first. Sure. My dad was born and raised in Riverhead, New York. He went to Holy Cross College and Harvard Law School and served in the Navy. But afterwards, he came back to Riverhead, where he was a local attorney. He served as Riverhead Town Attorney and Justice of the Peace. And then in January of 1963, he was appointed to the county court of Suffolk County by Governor Rockefeller. He, along with uh, Judge George McInerney, were appointed to two open positions and then in 1968, he um, ran for Supreme Court at a time when the state had also increased the number of Supreme Court justices statewide. And he served on that bench until his retirement in 1998. So where, where was his, like what facility was he working out of? He mostly worked out of the Riverhead courthouses, the both the ones on uh, Court Street or right in downtown Riverhead, and then also in the complex across the river next to the jail uh, in the later part of his career. He did travel into the city for some parts of his job because he served for many years on the appellate term, which is a, a state appeals court for lower courts. And he served in Brooklyn for that. And um, he also had various statewide teaching and committee assignments that would bring him into the city and to upstate New York. But his offices and his primary place of work was Riverhead. How would you characterize the types of cases, or could you characterize the types of cases he heard? Um, well, over the course of his career, he heard both criminal and civil trials. Um, when he was on the county court in the 60s, he and Judge McInerney were hearing all of the sort of felony level cases in Suffolk County at that time. Um, I was going through notes that my dad made, and he, um, he uh, over that time period, he presided over criminal and civil, and then the same on the Supreme Court when he went on to the Supreme Court, uh, both criminal and civil trials. Though my dad was a bit of a criminal specialist, he was on a statewide committee that developed jury instructions for judges in criminal trials, wrote sort of standard standard instructions that they could use. He was also the supervising judge of the criminal courts of Suffolk County from 1978 to 1992. And he lectured in the state judicial education program on criminal courts. So he was well-versed in the criminal law. Um, though I would also add that one of his, other than the Amityville Horror case, one of his most uh, notorious cases was very late in his career when he ruled in a civil trial, non-jury trial, that Lilco had brought against the town of Brookhaven and the Shoreham Wading River School District about the property taxes they were assessed during the time that the Shoreham power plant was being, nuclear power plant was being built, but never went 
um, never went into commission. So one of my dad's last mm. trials that was that made big news was a uh, was a civil trial. Now, just uh, this, that's not a case detailed in the book, but since I've done uh, we we've done an episode or two on the the Shoreham plant, so I'm just curious what was the ruling that that he was involved in there. Yeah, the case, as I understand it, and I'm grossly simple, simplifying, I'm sure, was that for many years, Lilco was assessed property taxes based on the plant being um, running. And Lilco sued to reduce their property tax burden based on the fact, I believe, that the nuclear power plant never came online. So the ruling was quite a bit, and I don't have the figure in front of me, um, but millions in back taxes that the town and the and the uh, school district were responsible for to pay back to Loco. It's interesting. I think in in your in the conclusion of the book, it seems your father had always said his obituary would start with the line that he was the judge of the Amityville horror case, and that's what happened. Yeah. No, it really is the case that I would say is his most notorious and the one that he sort of loved talking about and loved continuing to follow, you know, because of course, as any Long Islander or as anyone knows, the case achieved tremendous notoriety because of the haunting story that followed. And, um, you know, it's been subject to countless, obviously the original Abity Horror, Amityville Horror book and movie, been many more movies, uh, many more documentaries that still go on to this day. I know that you know. I sort of follow it now, and I, I just saw something a few weeks ago that a trailer for a movie called Amityville in Space. Oh, jeez! So it's a, <laughs> and then, uh, and I know that there's another documentary series being produced right now. So, and he was interviewed several times on camera, and he participated in many Amityville documentaries. So, you know, having to do with the murder trial. So it was something that was always of great interest to him and also great interest to the world. So I think that was his impetus for writing the book. Yeah. And, and I'll admit, I just, I watched the uh, Ryan Reynolds remake version to and, and prep to this. <laughs> and, and what's great about having your father's notes and his recounting of it is I, I was watching this version. I was saying, well, that's not true. That's not true. So, I mean, the, and, and the, the murders themselves stem to uh, late 1974 Correct. So, what can we say about the the actual crime itself and and the way it played out? Because none of none of the supernatural elements had anything to do with the initial case that your father heard. Correct. 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 And it wasn't. I think there's a little bit of in popular lore. People now sort of sometimes say, "Oh, DeFeo murdered his family because he was hearing voices or he was haunted," and he never made any such claim. And I mean, for any of your listeners who aren't familiar with the case. Um, his, he murdered his entire family, his parents and four siblings, in the middle of the night as they slept. He went from room to room with a high-powered rifle and shot all of them. And then he proceeded to pick up the shell casings and his bloody clothing and dumped it in a storm drain in Brooklyn and threw the rifle out into the bay and went on with his life that following day ran into a bar that evening saying, oh my God, my pa- you know, everyone's dead in my house. And that's how the crime was, um, was found. But he, in, at the trial, there was never any discussion then that, that he was motivated at all by supernatural forces. Um, he did uh, confess to the crime uh, essentially right away. He was questioned by police that evening. And his initial story was that he believed it was a member of the mob. Uh, the DeFeo family had some alleged mob connections. A great uncle was apparently a member of the Genovese crime family. I'm not sure if any of these things are entirely true, but there was enough suspicion that when he said, oh, it was this mobster who did it, they were, you know, they actually alerted the Suffolk County Organized Crime Division. But then during the night, they found the box with. Um, the empty rifle box in his room. And uh, someone else said, oh, yes, Ronald DeFeo owned guns. And they started looking more closely at him and he confessed the next day. So at trial, it was uh, he took an insanity plea, um, but he got right up on the stand and said that he shot his family. He claimed it was self-defense, that they were out to get him, that he'd overheard them talking about him, talking about maybe trying to kill him. But he never said, um, you know, 
a flying pig made me do it or whatever was in the Amityville Horror. Well, and what's interesting, reading your father's account, he, he used every other version of the events except a supernatural. Like he, at one point, uh, apparently claimed his sister shot two of the brothers and then... Yes, over the years, his his version of the events changed over and over again. Um, he was interviewed many times. A Newsday reporter interviewed him in the 1980s, and he was interviewed by TV crews on several occasions. And as time goes on, he developed this story that his sister Dawn had shot various combinations. Some stories were that Dawn had shot the siblings and he shot the parents. And in all of those versions of the story, it ends that he shot Dawn after she shot the rest of the family. Um, He also had a version of the story that came up in appeal, in an appeal that was before my father in the early 90s, that he had actually not been at the house at the time, that he had been married and living in New Jersey. And his mother had called him saying, Dawn's having a fight. Can you come? And he came and that he and he came with his alleged brother-in-law and they were in the basement and then they heard the shots and went upstairs and discovered Dawn had shot everyone. So they looked into that and he was in fact living in the house in Amityville at the time and he was not li- married and not living in New Jersey and he did not have a brother-in-law. Um, but, you know, he his, his story changed many times. The only time he came close to sort of making a connection to the supernatural. There was a researcher named Hans Holzer, who's a parapsychologist who wrote about the case. And he went to the house, the Amityville house, soon after the the story of the haunting came out. And he's the one who who was with a medium who said there was a that they were on an Indian burial ground, which has been denied since. And Holzer interviewed DeFeo in prison and sort of got him to say something about, well, maybe there were strange voices. But then in later interviews, DeFeo denied that there were any strange voices or that he'd ever said that. So he never really used the haunting excuse. So I, I was about seven or eight when, when the, in real time, you know, in, in, the, in the real chronology. So I, I don't know. Do you remember or what did your father say about as the trial was going on? What was the atmosphere around it? Because obviously it was a high profile case, regardless of the supernatural or not. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think I must have been about junior high age or maybe middle school during the, you know, if I do the math on it, um, yeah, probably middle school. And I have very distinct memories of my dad talking about the trial at the time. And he would, in a very matter of fact fashion at dinner, say like, well, then, you know, he went into the room with his rifle and he shot this kid. And then he went and shot. And my mother, I'm sure, was horrified that dad was describing these things to to children. And neighbors tell a funny story of my dad coming over for dinner one night and basically regaling the entire table with the stories of the DeFeo murders in a very matter of fact way. But I I don't think I was aware of the outside publicity. I think I was young enough that I mainly just knew that my dad had this case and he would describe the day's testimony and he would talk to us about, you know, how you would shoot people. (laughs) That I have a strong memory of. Well, and and it's curious. There's some overall themes I kind of pulled from the the accounts in the book. It it seems like a lot of people waived the right to attorney very quickly. And I mean, the, what were some of the tips your father might have given you about how the legal system works? I know. I noticed that, too. It does seem like does seem like an awful lot of people waive their rights to speak to an attorney. And um, I uh, I will let people judge what they what they will about that, um, knowing what they know about the Suffolk County uh, police force at this point. But um uh, yes, it did often seem like people were quick to give statements to, statements to the uh, to the police. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what other lessons would come out of it, but I would say to anyone, you know, you have the right to an attorney. Yeah, and and you know, again, another we, we'll talk about some of the other cases, but the the lengths that the accused go to to come up with alibis that are quickly discounted or can be easily disproven. It, I, you know, I guess until you're in that situation, you don't know what you'll do. But. Yeah. And I mean, DeFeo, while he was not found guilty by reason of insanity, because it appeared he very much knew what he was doing, um, you know, I don't think anyone would think he was a mentally stable person. I mean, his his stories, ever-shifting stories, um, reflect his mental state as well. I doubt, I doubt he was sort of really thinking through 
I mean, who knows, but I'm just surmising that he wasn't coming up with like an airtight story and figuring out an exact alibi um, and things like that. You know, he was he was in the house that night, which was a difficult thing for him to get around when he was questioned by the police. Sure. And so uh, your father would have seen that the, the supernatural elements came from, from what I've read in reading, the, the, the subsequent owners of the house and, and the book by Jay Anson, I believe, that came out in uh, 77, 78. So what was your father's reaction to this turn in the perception of what the case was about? I mean, he never believed the haunting stories. Uh, he, you know, scoffed at that pretty quickly, though he was certainly interested in following that aspect of it. He has a you know, copy of the Amityville Horror is sitting on the bookshelf. And it's funny, I pulled it out and it's it's got the little clipped off price on it. So obviously somebody gave it to him as a gift. Hmm. So I'm wondering, <laughs> wondering who gave him the Amityville Horror book right after it came out. Uh, so he, he certainly followed the case. But although, I, you know, it's interesting because I don't know if he ever saw the movie. I wouldn't be surprised if he never did, but maybe. I can't ask him now, but... Or, or all the variations, like we've been saying, they, they kind of, they have a life of their own at this point. They do. I mean, I think that, um, and there are movies that people may not realize are also related to the Amityville Horror. There's the Conjuring series, which is, I, I'm too scared to go to horror movies, so I don't see any of these movies. But um, one of those Conjuring movies features some of the mediums who investigated the Amityville Horror, and it features in there. So it, it does keep coming up in it's really become a sort of centerpiece of haunted house lore in this country. Um, I spotted a few weeks ago a Life magazine special edition on the world's most haunted places, and Amityville was in one, the Amityville house was one of those. So it really doesn't matter how many years people have lived there without, you know, it, people have lived in that house from, you know, since 1976 or 77 without any further hauntings, but it doesn't really matter to, to people who are true believers. Right. And, and for better or worse, if anyone knows anything about Long Island, that's probably the one, one community they can name on Long Island is, is Amityville for that reason. It's true. Yep. Yeah. I don't know if it drives the people in Amityville bananas or if they like it. I let them speak to that. Well, yeah. And, you know, the other thing you pick up from the book is how litigious people, there's a lot of, well, if you dig into the Amityville case, there's a lot of countersuing between the parties involved and the who published what book and who's infringing on whose copyright of the story. Exactly. Because the Lutzes who, they're, they are the subject of the Amityville horror story. They had originally sort of come up with this story in partnership with DeFeo's former attorney, William Weber. And he, they were going to do a book together, and then they went another direction and did the book with Jay Anson, and there were lawsuits over that, and there were lawsuits by the next owners of the house who sued because they were their life was being made miserable by all the people who would come by the house. So to get on to some of the other cases, and maybe to the mind of, of your father or the type of mind you know the, of a judge, it, it's interesting. He, he's detailing some obviously horrible cases, murder cases, but he's the points of law seem to fascinate him too. And and I'm thinking of the Ardito case where the, the woman basically hired someone to kill her boyfriend or ex-boyfriend and she feigned insanity or was able to put off sentencing for a long time. Right. Can you talk about that case and, and what that element that seemed to interest your father in terms of how to decide whether someone's insane or not? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the Vicky Ardito case was sort of a major case in my dad's career. Um, I think partly because of its longevity on how long it was before him, but I think he also was sort of personally fascinated with it. You know, in general, when you read the book, my father is sort of most interested in points of law, and, and a lot of what he discusses in the book is sort of what was behind his rulings and why he sort of, you know, accepted a psychiatrist decision or certain things like that. Um, but the Ardito case, I think, really stuck with him. As you said, she hired some hitmen to to murder her boyfriend. Uh, they had a house in Lloyd Harbor, and men came to the house and abducted uh, her boyfriend, Benjamin Matana, brought him to the swamps of Howard Beach, where he was shot. And Vicky, during that time, claimed to be a victim as well, but then was discovered that she had hired the hitmen. They all went on trial together and 
partway through the trial, she had a bit of a breakdown question. I mean, she, I think my father had some doubts as to whether she'd had a breakdown or whether she was faking that to get out of the trial midway. But, you know, psychiatrists did examine her and feel that she was not mentally competent to continue to stand trial. And my father accepted that and declared a mistrial. And then um, she spent six years in various state mental hospitals and was it finally at the end of that time period, a different judge ruled that she was competent to stand trial, at which time she left the mental hospital and went to Florida and sort of lived on the lam and then was brought back to my dad's court. So I think that one of the reasons that this case was so central to my father's memory was sort of the time he spent on it. And when she came back, she basically decided to plead guilty, but then she had second thoughts about that. And so there was, it was a case that had a lot of twists and turns after she came back in terms of whether she was in fact going to plead guilty um, and not. And so that was a, a big part of that trial as well. Now, there are a few instances um, where on later appeal or, or other courts might have reversed a decision or, or you know, something that your, your fathers had um, decided. How did he feel about those situations? Did he take it in stride or is that part of the process or? it's part of the process, but I think you never, you never really like it. I mean, there was some, there's one of the cases where the, um, the Gallagher case, which was a really a terrible, tragic case, a Daniel Gallagher case that he was a New York city police officer who got tremendously intoxicated on St. Patrick's day and shot a fellow cop who had been out, they'd been out drinking together. And my father's, uh, sentence was, was later the the verdict was later reversed because of instructions my father had given in terms of how the jury could consider a few criminal charges and um and I know that was something that you know he felt badly that he had sort of done it that way and that it was you know that it went that way but another case that I put in the Bartolomeo um I added a few things beyond what my dad had put in based on writings he'd left behind and one of them was a case, a 1978 murder by a defendant called Bartolomeo, and it was reversed on appeal and became a sort of rule that was relied on for many years in the New York state system. It was called the Bartolomeo rule, and it had to do with access, giving someone access to a, to a lawyer uh, based on whether they'd ever um, had a previous crim- arrest or criminal charge. And... I think that stuck in my dad's craw that that was reversed. And then it was eventually reversed by the New York State Court of Appeals and went back to what my father had actually found. So I think that was satisfying to him. So I do think that judges pay attention to that and, you know, don't always, you know, my dad liked the fact that he generally, the rulings he made were upheld on appeal. I think the Gallagher case was an exception. Sure. And and it, I was reading through, I always read the secondary material in, in, in books. So just the, the idea of bench notes for, for a, a judge fascinates me. So he would, are these things he, so when he decided to write this book, he could go back to his, based on, I don't want to simplify it and call it his diary, but he was keeping notes during the, during the trials. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what every judge does, but my father had, um, he had literally these red leather bound volumes that are still sort of sitting in storage. I'm not sure what I'll do with them. <laughs> and he took detailed notes during every trial. And then he would also do handwritten notes for his, for uh, when he gave sent instructions to the jury. So those were actually very great to look back on to sort of, you know, see if there was anything I wanted to sort of adjust a little bit based on, based on his notes, but he, you know, he wrote longhand, longhand notes for, for his jury instructions and, and kept all of them. So what do you, what do you think prompted him to create the book? Like what, what drove him to finally record all this to, for publication? Well, I think it was a few things. I mean, first of all, my dad in his retirement enjoyed writing. He was always a, had great interest in history and um, he wrote a, a, a history of the town of Riverhead after his retirement called uh, Riverhead, the Halcyon Days, sort of looking at the town's development from around the Civil War through the through World War One. So he had a real interest in history and in writing. And I think that he always sort of felt like the DeFeo trial was of such huge public interest. And he had so many 
feelings about and opinions on on how that trial had unfolded and how the um, you know the DeFeo story had continued for decades later. Uh, I think he even wrote something about how he'd been interviewed four times on camera, but those interviews didn't allow him to say everything he wanted to say. So I think that's what spurred him to write. And then as he was working on it, I think he decided, well, I've got a you know a handful of other cases here I'd like to include. And as I said earlier, you know, my father had finished writing this book when he died in 2014, but my sister and I sort of edited it and we went through, really didn't change it in drastic ways at all. We went through and so, you know, the files and newspaper clippings and added a little material, more explanatory material here and there. But my dad had also written at various points about many of his other trials. And so I pulled out a handful of those and added them as sort of a fifth part because I thought, you know, some of his other trials were, were pretty interesting as well. Yeah. And, and just to touch on that, it kind of chronologically gets us out of order, but it, sort of on a lighter note, um, the Southampton case and very early in his career brought him, it, it seems like, to some prominence just because of the nature of that case. Yeah, it's a, it's an amazing case. It was the, his first year as a judge in 1964. And I don't know, um, this may be, will be remembered by either sort of uh, longtime Southampton residents or students of social history, but there was a, uh, uh, a debutante party, a debutante Fernanda Wanamaker Weatherill in the Labor Day weekend, 1963, and a near the house, the family had rented a nearby beachfront mansion for the young men who were coming to the party to stay. And there was a rather raucous after party in which essentially all the young people from the party went over to the house, partied all night, they literally swung from the chandeliers, they broke almost every window in the house. They threw the furniture out on the beach. And it was initially, you know, the police were called and initially it was just sort of handled as, you know, not a big deal. But it started getting a little bit of press and the press coverage sort of took on this tone of how can you let these rich kids get away with this? Hmm. And um, it was interesting. Life magazine covered it and did a giant, you know, multi-page spread. And there were sort of these hand-wringing articles about the sort of, you know, the youth today and how lacking responsibility and not being held accountable. So the Suffolk County, you know, they ended up pursuing what were in essence misdemeanor charges about against more than a dozen of the men. And then that next year, four of them came up in trial to my father and he actually found them not guilty. As he writes, it was a difficult situation to attach any one piece of destruction to any one person. And so you really couldn't hold up the charges because you couldn't say that Joe Smith was the guy who broke the chandelier. So, but anyway, it was covered worldwide. And there were, you know, back in the day, UPI and AP, and they were sending wire stories. I, I mean, I was amazed when I researched this. I found like dozens and dozens of New York Times stories about it. The degree, it was on the front page numerous times. Hmm. So it was sort of, of of my father's trials. It's possibly the one that achieved, you know, with the, the maybe the exception of the DeFeo trial, achieved the most press attention. And it's a somewhat a forgotten story, but it's a, a it will be remembered in a few quarters. No, and, and it's interesting to think since he became involved in a, a second high profile case, what that earlier Southampton case taught him or, or did it kind of prepare him for what could happen to a judge thrust into the limelight like that? Yeah, well, he he got letters from like all around the world with people complaining that he'd let these young men off. And and he obviously was amused by that because he wrote about, and, you know, and I included in the book, several of those highlights of people saying, first of all, assuming that he was entirely corrupt, just, you know, like who's pay, you know, who's lining your pockets to let these kids off? And, you know, you're a terrible judge and you're a disgrace and your new career will never come to anything. So I think the very fact that he recorded those and saved them, I think, means he had a bit of perspective on the sort of what, you know, worldwide publicity can mean. And just in terms of perspective, I mentioned, you know, I, I listen to true crime and, and I know it's a 
phenomenon or popular genre, but there, there's a cumulative effect of reading so much about the horrible things that people do to each other. Is there anything you, you want to say or could say about how maybe your father dealt with it or, or what you've learned about dealing with this when it's something like someone's day job bringing home so much evil, for lack of a better word, in the world? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I mean, it's hard to say now because, you know, obviously my father's deceased and it's difficult. I can't ask him these questions, but it seems like he was such a sort of student of the law and such a, you know, he, he had such an interest in the, in the twists, the legal twists and turns of these cases that I don't think he brought home the sort of the human misery angle of it. I mean, it must have affected him. I mean, it was a, you know, several of these cases are you know, just tragic deaths. The DeFeos, these are children. There's another case where young children died. Um, but I, I, from what I can observe of knowing my dad and seeing what he wrote about that, he did seem to separate that out. I mean, he certainly would defer, you know, he would refer to these murders as being very tragic. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't ignoring the fact that there was great loss of life. But I think he was able to separate that. Now, just somewhat tangential note, but do you think hearing these accounts influenced you in any way becoming a writer, or do you think you and your sister being a writer helped him to put this work together? Uh, well, I'll address the second question first, because he, uh, when he was writing it, um, you know, both of my sister and I read it at various points and gave him some feedback, but he very much wanted to write his own book. He wasn't one to sort of like, oh, okay, I'll completely redo that. <laughs> um, but, you know, and so I think it mattered you know, for getting the book published posthumously that we were able to step in and be editors on it and, you know, add a little bit here and there. Though I really did try to retain my father's writings very much so. Um, and I guess the question of whether it influenced us, I mean, I suppose we were influenced by the fact that, you know, we were a family interested in literary matters and in the general, you know, with a general intellectual curiosity. But I don't know if it led to our, if there's a direct line to our careers. And where, where can people find the book? We want to make sure they, they get to it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, um, it's available on major booksellers such as Amazon and barnesandnoble.com. Uh, there's a website for it, horrifichomicides.com. And that has instructions on where to buy it, as well as some additional information about the book. And it really, any bookstore can order it. And I know that at various points, I've been seeing, trying to get it into some Long Island bookstores. I know it was being carried at Burton's bookstores in Greenport at one point. I don't know if they have any available copies, but you know, we'd love for more Long Island bookstores to pick it up as a local author. And it, it does fill a, a gap or a need or, or a side of the story that I, I haven't seen written from this perspective much, you know, the, mm -hmm. from the inside, from behind the judge's bench, right. um, this kind of contemporary history. It's great to see. Any, anything I haven't asked you or anything you want to get across about any of this experience or your father's experience? No, no. I think we've covered a lot. So I think okay. this is great. I just hope people who are interested in these cases and sort of, you know, Long Island history in the 70s and 80s you know, may be interested in the book. I hope so. And thank you again to Ellen. We were speaking over Zencaster. You will find links to related resources in our show notes, including where you can find horrific homicides. That's at longislandhistoryproject.org. We hope you enjoyed that interview, and if you did, all we ask is that you share it with a friend. If you know someone obsessed with the Amityville horror case, why don't you send this link along, shoot it out in an email, post it on Facebook. It is part of Long Island history, so help us spread the word that there is a podcast out there dedicated to covering these types of topics. We appreciate your support. And that will do it for this episode. As always... Thank you for listening.